Hi, I'm Jenny Brockie. Tonight on Insight, how to deal with anxiety. I thought I was having a heart attack. I was utterly convinced that I would wake up tomorrow and the world would have ended. My psychologist nicknamed me Doomsday Dingra because I was always <laughs> thinking about the worst case scenario. I'm able to manage it a lot better now. It doesn't seem as scary anymore. I have anxiety, that's, that's me, that's part of who I am. I hope I'm evidence that you can get through it and you can turn it around. My name is Deborah Hart. I'm a French horn player. Today I'm playing in the West Australian Symphony Orchestra and they're accompanying um, Star Wars, the first movie, the first original Star Wars. I'm choosing to look forward. <laughs> With horn, there's a lot of risk involved. As you go higher, it's very easy to miss the right note. And our egos are closely tied to whether we get the right note or not. It's the best and the worst. So when it goes well, it's exhilarating. And you feel like the world is yours. But when it doesn't go well, you just want to die. The anxiety is multi-level. So uh, in the moment, it's things like a physical reaction, so sometimes it's shaking or a dry mouth. And it's often sort of thoughts of, I can't do this, I'm gonna mess it up, I'm gonna miss that note, everybody's listening. I think the biggest stressor for me, at least, is worrying about what my colleagues think about me. The worst my anxiety has been was over a long period of stress. I remember sitting on stage, it was just an overwhelming panic. And I don't know what's real anymore, whether there was a fly in my mouth, but I thought there was a fly in my mouth and I actually had to stop playing and walk off and get a drink of water. And that was a terribly shameful experience and it took a, took a number of years to get over that. Once we let go of our expectations about ourselves and these rules about how we're supposed to be and the actual act of playing music is, is fun again. Deborah, thanks so much for joining us and thank you everyone for joining us uh, to talk about anxiety tonight. Tell me a little bit more about that moment you described there where you had to walk off and you thought you had the fly in your mouth. What, well, you were playing solos in that performance. Yes, uh, there were, there were two, two moments around the same time. One, I was playing a, uh, some chamber music and another one, I was playing uh, a solo with a piano. And I suppose my anxiety was, was, was getting worse around this time because I was taking more risks as I got better as a performer. I was given more opportunities and in those opportunities was uh, panic. Mm. <laughs> and what was it like when you actually did walk off stage? Uh, it's very embarrassing. I just walked over to the edge of the stage to get a drink of water and then I resumed and I kept on going and it sort of broke the panic. So it, it's... So it dissipated after that? Yeah. 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 Well, it didn't dissipate but I, I kept on going and, and the worst was over. How did you deal with it in terms of the audience at the time? I, not very well. I didn't, I didn't talk to them. I didn't explain it. I, I just sort of pretended it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> You've been dealing with anxiety since you were a child. Do you remember when it started? Um, I don't know if I've been dealing with generalised anxiety, but I've definitely been dealing with performance anxiety since I was 10. And has the anxiety been mostly around performing but in other, or in other situations as well? For me, it's largely about performance. I has it affected your career? Oh, yes. You don't, you don't win auditions when you fall apart in auditions. So uh, you don't get the job that you want. Um, you, your career doesn't progress or it doesn't progress as fast as it possibly could if you could audition without anxiety. And if you look at your anxiety levels now, yep. compared to those incidents you describe, where would you say you are now compared to then? I, I think I probably still have the same levels of anxiety, but I just don't get hooked up 
with it anymore. It's still there, but I behave differently. Tim, you're CEO of Parkrun, and you started Parkrun here in right. Australia. You didn't have a history of anxiety. Tell us what happened to you at the airport a couple of years ago. No, that's it. So I live up in the Whitsundays, and I sort of was getting dropped off at the airport by my wife and kids, as had happened many, many times before, and went through security, went and sat down, and just from absolutely nowhere, heart rate just started going through the roof. And as you, as you mentioned, I have no history of anxiety or panic or anything like that. So I didn't actually know what was going on. Were you I've, scared of flying normally? No, or? never. No, I've, look, I've flown hundreds of times when I was sitting in the airport and I, I thought I was having a heart attack. I was just in this huge state of panic. You weren't tempted to say to somebody, look, I think I might need to go to hospital yeah, or something? Yeah, I, I think because it was so foreign to me, just that that concept of, of anxiety and, and, and fear was such a foreign thing that I really... I think I was just confused. I didn't really know what was happening. I didn't know what to do, who to talk to. How um, long did it last? Well, I got off the plane in Sydney and, and just basically collapsed on a chair and, and I, I rang my wife and, and we, I told her what had happened and, and I guess we started picking the pieces up from there. And I had a couple of days in Sydney where I sort of bluffed my way through a few meetings and dinners and things like that where the whole time I was feeling terrible. Got back up to the to home. Got up into the Witch Sundays, and 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 we, you know, it was really about okay, well, what next from here? Because that sort of moved from being this panic attack to just this anxiety that was just a constant, and so I had to work out what was going on. So it stayed. The anxiety stayed with you yeah, after the yeah. panic so it wasn't, subsided. Yes, it wasn't just a panic attack, and then everything was fine. It was panic, and then I think the confusion and everything of of what that created meant that I was now just anxious. So I was like, what happened? I don't know what happened. Is it going to happen again? How bad did that anxiety get that stayed with you? Yeah, so initially, I probably... I remember having at least uh, one occasion where I didn't want to leave the house. I just felt like I couldn't go out and sort of face people and face social situations. Um, and this was really foreign to you? Oh, totally. Like, I... You know most confident kind of life of the party kind of person you could ever imagine. So it was a huge kind of blow to me uh, to, to go from being someone who felt like almost on a high all the time to being in this situation where, I, yeah, I didn't want to leave the house. So I had three months off work um, just to, you know, reset myself. Um, but it's something I live with every day. I mean, I think, you know, once you have it, it probably never fully goes away. Um, and, yeah, here we are. Mm. How would you compare how you are now to how you were when that happened? I think the big difference is now I've, I'm much more in touch and in tune with, with that side of, of me. Like, as, as I mentioned, I, I didn't know what was happening when it, when it happened. Whereas when anxiety happens now, in my head straight away, I can say, well, I know what's going on here. This, this is anxiety. I've been here before. I've gotten through it. I'll get through it again. Guy, you're a management consultant with a major international company. At its worst, what's your anxiety been like? It was like being chased by a lion. I, I remember standing in a park outside a client building. It's a very safe place, very friendly, the sun was shining, um, but I felt like I was literally going to die uh, and I couldn't breathe. Um, I, I couldn't, I was not in control of my emotions. I went to serve that client had, had, the, uh, had the issue and took several weeks off. I then uh, I sought professional help, got a few things going. I felt, right, I'm ready to go again. And so I went back, uh, ready to face the lion, or so I thought. Um, 48 hours later, it happened again. Mm. Um, and I had to fly all the way home again. And at that point, I thought my career was over. And did it hit you out of the blue like Tim? No, so I, I would describe myself as a GAD or a generalised anxiety disorder sufferer. I've lived with it since, similar to Deborah, since about 10. What I just described earlier this year was one of those peak experiences where it went past being able to cope under any circumstances. What's it like trying to manage that in the corporate world? I, I will say that uh, I was unconditionally supported through this experience this year, which was wonderful. This is absolutely the same as a physical injury or a physical illness. But in those moments, it is extremely difficult if you're not prepared. And is there a pattern to when it hits you? Uh, so for me, it's um, situations where um, unfamiliar context um, coupled with uh, I have very high standards for myself, so I always want to deliver the very best for my clients, for my family, for my friends. It can really make you feel very uncomfortable because you feel like you're 
unable to do what you think you need to do and in, in that you become paralysed. Mm. And just describe a little more what it's like. I mean, you said it's like being chased by a lion. Tell me, tell me about the physical effect sure. it has on you. Your palms sweat. You feel like there is an animal pacing around just behind that corner, just around there. <laughs> and, it is, and it's exhausting, Jenny. It is exhausting. Mm -hmm. Tim talked about collapsing after the flight. I, I, I needed a week just to recover from 48 hours of it. It was frightening. Mm. And just briefly, how would you describe how you're dealing with it now compared to in the past? So I'm now serving a, a client in Sydney, which is wonderful. Um, I'm very much back to my old self. Anxiety never goes away from an anxiety sufferer. It is your ability and resilience to cope with it when it happens. And at the moment, I'm coping and I'm in a good space, which is great, supported by my family, my friends and my work colleagues. Gemma, you were living in Bangkok four years ago when you had your first bout of anxiety. Correct. What happened? Um, I had been headhunted to go and work in Bangkok at a very corporate job, which I wasn't used to. Um, it was my first time living alone. I was um, in a relationship that was already failing in Australia and so trying to do long distance was, you know, just exacerbating a problem that was already there. Um, and then I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to do really well in this job. You know, I've always been a type A personality, but this was like a new level of pressure for me. Um, and then sort of about three weeks in, I started having these kind of weird sort of physical sensations. Um, I, would, I wasn't able to sleep. Um, I was constantly worrying all the time. Um, I was having what everyone else has described as feeling like a heart attack. And then suddenly um, I started having these really catastrophic thoughts. So as well as the physical stuff, it was, it was full on kind of, um, you know, thoughts about um, my parents back in Australia. I was worried that, you know, my mum would get in her car and have a crash and I was in a foreign country and really far away and unable to stop it. Um, and how often were those thoughts going through your head? Uh, almost daily. Um, so it would often happen at night because it would be when I was about to go to sleep. What did you do? At the time, I didn't really know what was going on. Um, I wasn't really familiar with anxiety. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've always kind of had it, even from childhood, um, but hadn't really put a label on it or didn't even really understand the concept of it. So. I didn't really do anything. I just sort of let those thoughts happen and um, didn't know any ways to manage it. And you came back home? I did end up coming back home after five months. Um, it reached a point where the anxiety was so bad that I couldn't be there alone anymore. What happened last year? Last year, um, I was in another similarly high pressure job. Again, I put heaps of pressure on myself to succeed and I found that the stress was kind of spiralling out of control again in a similar way to what was happening in Bangkok. Um, but this time the thoughts manifested into um, sort of more broader global thoughts about um, terrible things happening. So like? I found that every time I read the news or heard a flippant remark about, um, you know, terrorism or North Korea or climate change or any kind of awful thing happening, uh, my thoughts would spiral out of control and I became convinced that the apocalypse was around the corner. So um, initially it was just kind of sort of background thoughts that I was observing, but then similar to in Bangkok, they became very real and I was utterly convinced that I would wake up tomorrow and the world would have ended. And um, what did that do to your life? It was really crippling. I couldn't focus on anything that was around me. Um, I would get to work and I'd, I'd be in that headspace. I couldn't concentrate on my work. I found it really difficult to engage with people around me. Um, I was really just in my own sort of head, really. I just, I wasn't in, aware of my physical surroundings. At the time, did you think you'd get through it? No. I didn't. I thought that that would be it forever. What about the rest of you? At the time, did you think you'd get through it? Tim? When you're right in the, in the thick of it and you're trying to deal with anxiety, you're just thinking about trying to get through the next second, the next minute, the next hour, the next day, that next sleep, trying to get a sleep in. Uh, so, uh, but certainly now I, can, I have perspective on things and I think we've, everyone said it, when you've got it, you've got it for life. But there is also a great life you can live 
whilst managing it. Mm. Did you think you could get through it, Guy? Uh, it, it was a great struggle, uh, Jenny, and once you get through it, there's then another fear that comes in, which is, OK, I'm now out of the lion's... Not, you know, the lion's a kilometre or so away, but will I ever be able to go anywhere near it again without it happening? But I hope I'm evidence that you can get through it and you can turn it around, but it's tough at the time. This is going to be with me for the rest of my life, um, and it's about learning how to manage it. It's developing a process to challenge your ways of thinking. Here's the anxiety again. It doesn't feel good, but can I choose to accept it and be willing to have it? Guy, what did you do after your most recent bout of anxiety to deal with it? So, the, for me personally, and it will differ by individual experience, the technique I use to build resilience to cope with triggers is, is CBT or Which cognitive, is cognitive behaviour, behaviour therapy. therapy. But for me, it is a combination of medication to smooth the peaks and CBT to build resilience around how I think and thinking about how I think. How did CBT work for you? Describe how it works for people who don't understand. It's developing a process to challenge your ways of thinking. So if I'd probably easiest if I highlight with an example. So if you um, make a say in my, in my role as a consultant, if I make a mistake and my client gets upset, an anxious person could think, oh, I've made a mistake. I'm actually going to, the client's not going to work with me anymore. They'll ask for me to be changed out. I'll probably lose my job. My team won't respect me. That's the original chain of thinking. CBT asks you to pause and think about realistic likelihoods, realistic consequences, and challenge you to not respond to the trigger in the way that you do, but to think more realistically about what may happen. And it's, it's like anything, it takes practice, um, but it does help you move from being an eight or a nine out of 10 when you make a stuff up, to actually going, oh, that's unfortunate. I still don't feel good about it. I still feel a bit anxious, but I don't feel like the world's gonna end. Mm. And what sort of a difference has it made to massive. your anxiety? Oh, massive. I, I mean. I, I live with anxiety, as many in this audience do, but I live with it more comfortably now. So the lion is in a cage and I can go, I can see it and I can point at it, I can even go and say hello, um, knowing that there's a strong lock on that cage and that lock is the way I'm challenging my thoughts. The moment I stop doing it, I might as well undo that padlock and swing the gate open. So your anxiety is an animal? A wild animal? Me metaphorically <laughs> speaking, yes. Yeah, metaphorically speaking, that's what it feels like. Rachel, you're a clinical psychologist. You specialise in treating anxiety. Mm -hmm. Explain how CBT works. It's based on the premise that the way in which we think drives how we feel and what we do, our behaviours, and then our emotions and behaviours feed back into how we think. So what we're doing in treatment for anxiety is helping people to identify the appraisals that they're making in situations when they feel anxious. And one of the techniques we use is cognitive therapy to help them to reappraise those uh, situations, to think about them differently and uh, therefore to feel less anxious. So is it about trying to change people's thoughts or challenge people's thoughts? Challenge them and in that process they will then change the way they're thinking. Danny, you've done CBT. Did it help with your anxiety? Yeah, it really did. I feel like the first few times um, I did seek help, um, it was a real challenge finding a um, psychologist or a psychiatrist that worked for me. How did your anxiety affect you? It was constant. Um, the way that Gemma described their anxiety, it was the exact same thing. Like, um, I was almost shocked to know that not everyone had that thinking pattern. Like. I'd say to my friends, I'm like, aren't you guys worried about like a tsunami taking over Melbourne and the whole city going underwater? Like, you guys aren't freaked out about that? Like, and everyone's like, no, no. <laughs> no Danny, that's, that's something else. So it was just moments like that where every single day I was going on this spiral of thought where um, either I was going to get harmed, people I love were going to get harmed, or the whole world itself would collapse in and my anxiety literally wouldn't let me get out of bed for a few months. So how does CBT help with that? I'll use an example. Um, I've got really intense triggers around having my drink spiked um, from an experience that happened a while ago and it'll get so intense that so someone... you imagine someone might be going yeah. to spike your drink. Yeah, and it kind of, it borders on the paranoia where, you know, I'll be at a cafe and a waiter will come over and pour some water in and I'll just be like, I'm not, I can't drink that. So CBT is about being like, all right, what are the facts? Yes, you might be feeling really anxious, but take a moment to actually think, what are the facts? 
and compare them with what your beliefs are and then try and re-energise yourself and convince yourself that you're safe. Your anxiety isn't your whole brain. There's something in your brain that's mm. telling you these things. They're so just challenging it. Now, you've had it since you were in high school. Do you remember how it started? I've always been someone who was quite anxious. Things that would impact people like worrying about rumours or worrying about like my reputation at school, like instead of just being something that concerned me, like it would leave me bedridden. Like I was at a party one night and I was feeling really comfortable. Um, I had a few like anxious thoughts like, oh, what if that person doesn't like me? I think that person spread a rumour about me and then suddenly like I was holding a cup and the cup just dropped and smashed all over the ground and I completely lost feeling in my arm and yeah I, it's so affirming and terrifying also to hear that so many people have said it feels like a heart attack because I did I, I thought I was dying like when I dropped that glass and I realised I couldn't feel my arm like my heart rate increased my other arm went numb and I was like this is it like in my head I was like this is the night that I die it was How so old terrifying were you? I was 15. Mm, yeah. Gosh. It was really intense, but um, yeah, I remember driving over a long hill and sorry, I was seeing the, the lights of the city and I was like, this is it. This is the last time I'll ever feel this. But it wasn't because it wasn't a heart attack. It was a panic attack. Mm. Mm. And now that you're having treatment and have had treatment, how often are you experiencing that anxiety now compared to before? You yeah. started treating it. As soon as you take that fear away of what the heck is happening to me, like as soon as you can name it, it becomes less scary. I reckon I experience it once or twice a week, but it's not nearly as scary because I know what's happening and it's just about how am I going to get through today, you know? Um, I read a really beautiful piece of nonfiction recently that said sometimes the only thing you can do is just look forward to your next cup of tea. Just those moments where you're like, it's small, but I did that today. Go me, I'm champ. <laughs> Good message. Um, John, you're a clinical psychologist. Now, you used to use traditional CBT to treat anxiety, but now you don't just do that. Why? One of the difficulties of conventional therapy is it tends to focus too much on the individual as if there's something wrong with the individual. Something, often there's something wrong with their life. And people need to understand that. It may be their current life, but it may be their, the life they've had. So if we've grown up with abuse, neglect, very high expectations, bullying, rejection, criticism, stuff like that. We internalise that. It changes the way we th think about ourselves, changes the way in which we see other people, our expectations of the world and a sense of our future. So I think we need to take into account the whole context of a person's life. The big danger of therapy is that we get, for therapists, is they get captured by a particular way of seeing the world. Uh, and that's a really helpful framework, but that can also blind us to overlook things that are unique and individual and necessary. So how do you treat it? I think you need to look at the beliefs that drive the thoughts. If we're constantly battling with the thoughts, have to ask ourselves, where are those thoughts coming from? Why do I keep getting those thoughts? Mm. Anubhav, uh, you tried CBT. Did it help you? My anxiety came on very early. I felt that I, because of my abuse, in primary school in India, I felt that I was the wrong person. And that when we went through CBT and challenging the thoughts, I would go through the 10 sessions and go back to my psychologist after the 10 sessions over, thinking that it was helping, but then we would sit back in therapy and we were back to square one. And then he sort of suggested there is a new way, there's acceptance commitment therapy. And he said that that sort of stood right with me in the sense that rather than trying to fix myself or changing my thoughts, it was a first and foremost about this is me, this is who I am. Mm. Now, acceptance and commitment therapy is called ACT. ACT, that, yes. That's its, its abbreviation. What sort of anxiety were you experiencing and how did using ACT help you deal with that anxiety? Uh, when I was a young kid in school, it was OCD, severe OCD. And then it sort of branched out in university to generalise anxiety, had one bout of depression. So the way ACT helped me was um, under sitting in the moment and realising, OK, this is happening to me. So I think there's something called mindfulness. And that really helped me as part of ACT because for me it was just let me live in the moment because 
my psychologist nicknamed me Doomsday Dingra. My last name is Dingra because I was always <laughs> thinking about the worst case scenario. It was like, but what if this happens? But what if this happens? But what if this happens? And it just went on to that spiral. And it was about, okay, just come back to now. Just, let's just focus on now. Okay, mindfulness is interesting because that comes up a bit too. And Danny, you, you, it didn't help you mindfulness? Um, I found that um, meditation didn't really help me as much, but I feel like a lot of times when I've been chatting to people about what mindfulness means, it was about sitting down and closing your eyes and focusing on your breath. And unfortunately, because um, I suffer from a lot of dissociation, closing my eyes and breathing, my I almost start hallucinating. Mm. Uh, Deborah, you've used ACT, mm -hmm. Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Has it helped you? Immensely. It's it, it, it's uh, the most helpful part of, about ACT, well, it's the mindfulness, um, especially when you're performing, noticing and labelling the thoughts, mm. the sensations, the sensations, oh, my goodness, I've got a dry mouth. Oh, isn't that interesting? Um, oh, my goodness, my hands are shaking. Ah, oh, OK. And... Uh, but and is there a sense of saying, I know this feeling, I've felt it before? Exactly, yes. And it it's, gives you a certain distance from it. But I think the most valuable part of ACT is, is values, is learning to live a valued life in the presence of anxiety. Um, and especially sort of when I'm sitting on stage, um, who do I want to be when I'm sitting on stage? Do I want to be the person that makes the mistake that is shaky um, or who misses the note or who appears uh, that, they, that they can't play music very well. No, I want to be, be a strong person. I want to be brave. I want to play. So the values part of ACT is essential. It actually, um, it takes the focus away from the anxiety. So what's it like performing now? Um, I, 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 I can honestly say it's a lot more joyful. I think I overall play better and uh, I don't, I still dread it, but I don't dread it as much and I accept, I accept even the dread. Mm. Stephen, uh, you're a clinical psychologist and you've pioneered ACT. Explain it for us. So ACT is about opening up to your feelings and thoughts as they are, not as what they say they are. And then as a whole human being coming into the present moment and what am I here to do? What's possible with other people and with what I really care about? And then taking your attention, not to get away from the anxiety, but move it towards your own life. Mm. You suffered from anxiety I yourself. did indeed. How did anxiety affect you personally? Well, I was on top of the world. I was in a mid-major university. I'm producing all this research. And then I'm in sitting in a horrific department meeting where I'm watching these full professors fight. And suddenly I can't talk, I can't breathe. I can't, you know, my heart's going 150 beats a minute. And I'd raise my hand to ask them to, could we tone it down and just be a little more human? And by the time they turned to me, I, I was like a goldfish going, ah, ah, and it was out of a bowl of water. I mean, I couldn't even make a sound. And, and so was that that's the first a pretty big impact. Was that the first time that you'd was experienced the first time. something that severe? And I would probably say, you know, I, I would have said, I'm not an excellent person. I'm not. I'm see. I'm blah, blah. no, but I was suppressing anxiety. When did you start thinking about the whole idea of accepting anxiety? When anxiety hit, and I was just fighting and struggling and doing my relaxation tapes and trying to re restructure my thoughts. And the more I did that, what I was taught to do in graduate school, uh, I just felt like I was spitting into a hurricane. I mean, it. it, it it was not going to give me traction for me personally, and I had to hit bottom. Uh, and then the hitting, hitting bottom had this transformational kind of quality where I suddenly realized how the voice within had dictated to me th that I had to win this life and death war with anxiety and there was something that was 180 degrees in the other direction. Something opened up and the sort of cloud that was on me lifted, I mean within minutes. And so I was lucky enough to be a scientist and a psychologist, and I took that moment and said, I'm going to understand that. I'm going to dedicate my life to understanding what just happened. How is ACT different to cognitive behaviour therapy, which has been the traditional treatment it has that's been, that's been and used it's a, for And it's decades. a wonderful treatment. And it works for people. And it's evidence-based. And, and, man, if you're doing that with exposure and with a competent person and, and it's working for you, please do that. 
uh, and act as part of that family. We actually are sort of part of the family of CBTs, but traditional CBT had this idea that you had to change the form of your thinking in order to change the form of your feeling so that you could behave differently. What ACT asks you to do is change your relationship to your thinking, change your relationship to your feeling, and get on about the business of living now. So don't try to fight it. Don't try to words. fight it, but don't try to tolerate and resign yourself to it either. Anu, uh, you're a software engineer. You've had two major bouts of anxiety. Yeah. Um, what was going on for you when they happened? Um, so the first one was uh, just when I was doing my doctorate, and uh, basically it was just the anxiety was just about um, uh, you know, all my friends have got jobs. What am I doing with my life right now? And uh, my second bout of anxiety was actually during my marriage. And I realized that, you know, I I'm an only child as well. So I'd spent all my life only trying to please my parents. Um, and then suddenly during this marriage procedure, I was, tr I was trying to please so many people at once. <laughs> this is the run-up to a marriage? <laughs> Highly stressful. Yeah. Highly stressful. Yeah, pretty much. There was one, one moment where I was uh, it, just like messages being exchanged and I met my uh, wife-to-be and I wouldn't consider myself to be like a violent person in any way, but I, I kind of like, I raised my voice a little bit and even that to me, it was like so not who I was. So out of character. So out of you. character. Mm -hmm. And I just like, at that point, I just like, okay, I, I, you know, what is going on? It was just, it, I wouldn't say it's a blackout, but it was like something, just some other creature coming out uh, in a way. And raising your voice to your fiance yeah. actually prompted you to get help. I, I mean, I was, I was kind of already seeing someone. So I'd, I'd had one session before that, but at that, at that point, I was just like, uh, yeah, I need more sessions. <laughs> You know, one of the things that really helped me was this idea of, um, you know, you know, about this, the, giving your brain a name, and uh, you know, and, and saying, "Brain, what are you talking about? What are you thinking right now?" <laughs> and then moving on, and that actually helped me quite a lot. That's one of the kind of practical uh, techniques that ACT teaches, and yeah. Mm. So you did ACT. I, yeah, yeah, I did ACT. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, and what was the difference for you in the way you reacted to your own anxiety? So I'd been doing meditation for a while and I always assumed that was about, you know, like shutting down the thoughts. And then one of the first things that my psychologist told me during the act is that you can't really shut them down, it's just observing your thoughts and just letting them happen. And that so not you. fighting them? Yeah, not mm. fighting them and mm. that helped me kind of calm things down a lot more, yeah. Mm. Jess, um, you had difficulty trying to go down this path. Yeah, and, and accept what you were feeling hmm. with your anxiety. Can you describe that? So it was it just constantly exhausting for me. So to say, what do you enjoy? What are your values? What are your beliefs? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, and so living that stale life for such a period of time, it was just a, it was hard to accept that. Um, and that's what I thought acceptance and commitment therapy was. Uh, I'm interested in this whole area of ACT and CBT because I know it's a bit contentious in the profession and, you know, there's arguments about it and so on. Um, Rachel, do you use ACT in your clinic? No, we don't. So under the Better Access to Mental Health Care Medicare Initiative, which provides eligible patients with up to 10 rebatable sessions under Medicare per year, we can only use CBT, not ACT. So CBT has the most robust body of evidence supporting it. And obviously Medicare are interested in uh, treatments that are cost effective and have a robust body of evidence supporting them. Is so that in, the way it actually works though in, in, in clinical practice for, you know, I, I mean, do people stick to the letter of the law around this particular therapy or I don't do know they what try other, different things? I don't know what other people do, but um, we need to be scientist practitioners. So we need to use evidence-based treatment and I don't know what other people do, but in our practice, we use CBT. And I think there's room for innovation, but before we take on new treatments, we need a robust body of evidence supporting them. What do you think of ACT? I'm not anti-ACT. In fact, what I think is CBT, the way we do CBT, we often incorporate aspects of ACT, but we just don't incorporate all the aspects. John, what do you think about this whole area of CBT Act? Well, we can get caught up in, uh, in labels and false differences. 
The fact is that these therapies have more in common than they have that separate them. There so if you actually observe a person and then try to decide what is this person actually doing, there'll actually be quite a lot of contention about what that person is really doing. And people often label what they're doing as something quite different. What in reality most people do is they're sensitive to the uniqueness of that individual and their suffering in their moment. And that they then apply to that the accumulated knowledge of evidence and their own personal experience to make an appropriate response to that moment and that individual. And in doing so, they normally draw upon a whole lot of things. I'm interested in the debate within the profession around the various treatments, though. Do you, know, do you think that one is dominating over the other or do you think they should all be used in combination with one another? How do you, how do you see it? Oh. <clears throat> Some people are very ideological. Um, some people get very committed. It becomes, it becomes almost a religion. Um, some people are lazy, frankly. You know, they get into a particular way of dealing with it. That's the way they see the world. It's a frame of reference. They don't have to challenge themselves. You know, one of the great things about ACT is it talks about flexibility. But flexibility isn't just a, a, a quality that we need in our patients. We also need in our therapists. Mm. The discussion that's never had, and is a really important discussion, is that there's as much difference between therapists in the effect as there is in the therapies. What is it that makes these, some people, almost regardless of what they do, really, really effective? Mm. That's something that we've been really afraid to look at in any detail, mm. and we can learn a great deal from. What about Rachel's point that the evidence isn't there to support ACT, that well, the studies haven't been done? That the, um, that the evidential base is changing all the time. It's very contentious and, you know, it's, people have different views about those sorts of things. Steve, th this argument that the science isn't in on ACT, what, what's your response to that? There's 250 randomised trials on ACT. CBT, traditional CBT will have more trials. But if you ask what any consumer should ask, which is, does it work? What's the outcome? And do you know why it works? ACT has actually as much or more evidence on the processes of change that liberate people. And in physical medicine, we're moving towards personalized medicine. We don't want one size fits all, a particular category, boom. We have not yet made that change when it comes to mental health areas. You'll be pushed into a five out of nine or a four out of seven diagnosis, and then a big protocol will come out and boom, you're supposed to follow it. But honest clinicians, and you just did it, will say you're gonna tweak the protocol to fit the person. And so here's what I'm saying. A powerful therapeutic relationship models psychological flexibility. And it allows us to get away from this silly kind of, you know, headbutting, which is pushed on us in part by government agencies that want to turn people into categories and treatments in the, in the things that just get shoved on people. And instead, what are the particular things going on in your life that could lift you up and transform that life? And so we, we are working together and I'm working hard with my traditional CBT colleagues to move us more in a process-based direction. Mm. And I think that's the future of mental health care. What about medication? Let's talk briefly about medication. Guy, what, what role has it played for you? For me, it's, it's, it's combinatorial. So it's medication takes the peaks away. Mm. But in my case, CBT is the resilience building techniques. But medication alone does not solve it but medication provides a basis to avoid peak experience. Are you taking medication now? Yes. Mm. Tim, what about you? Did you ever think about medication? No. Uh, well, I mean, it was discussed, but uh, it was never something that uh, I guess I went through with. Danny, medication for you? Yeah, I had a pretty weird journey with medication. All throughout high school, every time I'd go on meds, um, I'd honestly just feel like I was floating non-stop. Um, it was really horrible and I was really concerned for so long that medication wouldn't work. Um, and about three years ago, um, a lot changed in my life. The medication that I was on really just stabilised my mood and I love the way that you describe that. It takes the peak off the wave. Like, I, I thought that medication would be something that could fix something, but all it did was get me to a level where I could actually fix something. Absolutely. Anu, what about you? Did you ever...? Uh, as soon as I started uh, doing ACT, it actually helped me enough. And so, yeah, I never got to the point where I, I needed medication. Mm. So a mix amongst you of, of people who've used it and people who haven't. What, what do the, the experts here think about using medication to treat anxiety? Well, I think anxiety? we need to remember that anxiety isn't just a psychological and a cognitive process. It's a physical process. There's a physical changes. Everyone's described those physical changes here today. Um, so I think there are two circumstances under which medication can be useful. The first is that many times people's anxiety is in part the result of their having a very overactive, very reactive nervous system. And then it can sometimes be useful to dampen that whole thing down. 
um, and medication could be useful there. The second situation, which probably occurs more often, is where people achieve a, or find themselves so agitated, so distressed that they can't think properly, they can't think clearly, they can't make sense of the situation and take useful corrective action. In that situation, reducing the level ag of agitation to the point where people can rethink uh, their life and make effective decisions and take appropriate actions is very helpful. Long term, it can be problematic. One of the difficulties is that when we improve, we may then attribute it to the medication and not to our own efforts and the other things. So generally speaking, one should try to take it minimally and for as short as possible. But there will be some people who have to take for longer. Most people watching this will identify with anxious moments. How do you know when it's something you need to get help for, John? I think when it's distressing and debilitating, mm. uh, when it's really interfering with your life in an unusual way, uh, it's, it's reducing your capacity to focus, it's draining the life and the colour uh, from your experiences of everyday living. Um, the difficulty for that is that many people have been in this state actually for a very long time mm. and they sort of get used to it. How treatable is it? Part of the difficulty here is deciding what is the good outcome. Our treatments really do improve the quality of life for many people, their capacity to get back and manage, etc. But if we're talking about living a normal life or a better than previous life, I'm afraid we're probably looking at around about 30 to 40 per cent and that's it at the moment. It's way short of where we ought to be. Mm. There's more work to be done. How would you rate your level of anxiety yeah, these days? Yeah, uh, I'm definitely a lot calmer now. Uh, we got a cat recently, and if anyone wants an anxiety dampener, the cat is <laughs> amazing. Looking at pictures of golden retrievers on the internet <laughs> <laughs> always calms me down. Pets are featuring quite prominently. Yeah. <laughs> My name's Gemma, I'm 28, and I've been suffering anxiety since about the start of 2014. I have a number of things that I do to help my anxiety. Up until I really knew what anxiety was, I just saw cooking as something I found fun. But when the anxiety got worse, I treated it more as actually something as an outlet to relax myself and to stay centered and calm and focused and, and sort of mindful on what I was doing. Bread is a really great one for anxiety relief because it's such a slow process. Even mixing the flour because it's such a soft and kind of lovely thing to mix. The kneading process in particular I think is really valuable because you're using your body and, and you're touching it and you're kind of getting really engaged with what you're making. It's almost the feeling of a stress ball. You're using that same motion that you would with a stress ball and you're physically touching something that is quite nice and tactile to, to really focus you on. Pulling it out of the oven, it's that sense of you've done something really well and you've done something right. I think a lot of anxiety boils down to ruminating on something you might have done wrong or a mistake that you made and just kind of constantly overthinking it. So when you make bread and it's a successful product, you can't help but feel good about it. Gemma, how did you arrive at cooking? as something to help you with your anxiety? Um, my parents have always loved cooking and got me into it as a child. So I've always kind of um, gone into the kitchen and made my own things. I think as I got older and as I started working full time and all these pressures came onto me and um, I, I started really realizing the difference in mood when I was in the kitchen um, because I was wholly focused on what I was doing. Um, I was using my hands. I was very, as I said, very physical and touching things. And um, I really noticed that there was quite a big difference in how I was at work or, you know, out and about compared to how I was in the kitchen. So it's actually focusing you. It's, it's like a version of mindfulness. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Similar to what a few other people have said, um, I struggle with meditation in its kind of traditional sense. Um, you know, sitting down and, and sort of quieting, quietening your mind and mm. focusing on your breathing. I've never been great with that. So for me, that is a form of meditation, especially mm. baking and, and kneading dough and doing things that are very slow by nature. So do you have a house full of bread loaves or...? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had more time to do it. At the start of this year, um, I quit my job. Um, I found that the pressure was getting too much and um, I moved cities, so I took a very drastic approach to um, getting out of my lifestyle that I was leading last year. Um, I moved cities and I enrolled in cooking school because I realised how, um, how happy and calm it was making me and I thought, well, why not 
try and make a go of this properly and actually see if um, doing it for more um, of my week will actually help me. What else has helped apart from cooking? Um, for me, yoga is a really big thing. Um, I think the great thing with yoga is it kind of takes those principles of, of traditional meditation, like the breathing and the, the quiet time, um, but puts it into a more physical form. Um, so for me, uh, focusing on listening to the teacher um, keeps me in the moment. And it's also something physical where I'm actually using my body and um, not just lying there trying to be still. And how are you doing now? I'm doing much better. I think the big thing for me was uh, really reducing the number of things I had going on. So my life this year is a lot quieter. Tim, what does an average day for you look like now compared to before you had that panic attack at the airport? There was a lot of blurred boundaries for me between work and life. And so my wife and I, uh, we basically drew up this like, list of, of 20 dot points of things that we could change. And I'm sure will resonate with people here and on, on, on TV about things like behaviour with, with technology. So no more mobile phone in the bedroom. That's out now in the in the kitchen um, but even for me like I I had one phone now I have two I have a personal phone that it get, comes on after hours I have a work phone that's on in hours when works off that phone's off and that's it that's what the work day's done so there was a lot of changes like that um, but for me also like a lot of lifestyle things that are really important and hands down the most important thing in my life in terms of dealing with uh, you know my mental health is my physical health uh, and so when I first had my, my breakdown and was having my time off work, I just hopped on the exercise bike at home for 20 minutes every day, just really light, and I walked the dogs. You know, that, that was my exercise, but it, it still had me doing something. Uh, and now, uh, you know, I've, I've returned into what I was sort of more mainstream exercise. You know, I go to the gym and uh, I, I run a lot and no two days are the same for me. Uh, with with Parkrun, we're a growing organisation and there's always different things happening. But I mean, there's some non-negotiables for me in my day and, and that is around being active um, and it's making sure I get my work done. But, you know, the difference is that their work day has a start and the work day has, has an end uh, and it, it didn't used to have that before. Mm. And what about your anxiety? Yeah, look, it, it's pretty pretty low, I think you'd say now. I've, I've, I've come to understand it, manage it, um, but still comes back, whether it be a little bit of panic, a little bit of anxiety, but uh, I, I manage it a lot better now. Um, I'm completely functional, I'm very happy, um, and life's going on, that's good. Danny, how are you managing now? I'm managing pretty well. Um, I love the way that Gemma was describing about like hobbies being a, a real source of calm. I think for me, I've got so many hobbies. Like I'm such a hobby king. Um, I honestly, I love rock climbing. I love looking after my indoor plants. Shout out to my Monstera Franklin, if you're watching here. It's one of my plants. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, he's one of my good friends. That's um, the first for inside, a shout out to a plant. I yeah, think. well, I'm glad to be that one. Um, but honestly, um, one of the things that's changed my life the most is community. Um, for a long time, my anxiety was about not having any sense of belonging. Um, and from the bottom of my heart, I can say that discovering my sexuality and exploring my gender and finding a queer community that stands by me 110% has genuinely changed my life. I feel like I just want to burst into glitter anytime I think about all my queer friends because they just <laughs> pull me through so many things. So all my friends, my families, my plants and looking at pictures of golden retrievers on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Always calms me down. <laughs> Deborah, you now help other musicians and performers with their performance anxiety. What do you do? I um, do act largely um, and also a big component of self-compassion because um, self-compassion is, uh, well, perfectionism and being hard on yourself drives the anxiety. So um, when you make a mistake, it sounds cheesy, but practice being kind to yourself and deliberately mm. cultivating a kindness. Uh, I've got a, a blog that I talk about how difficult it is to sometimes deal with perfectionism and shame and, and um, judgment. Mm. Yeah. I know how would you rate your level of anxiety yeah, these days? Yeah, uh, I'm definitely a lot calmer now. Uh, my wife and I are happily married, you know, um, no kind of <laughs> personality kind of uh, issues. <laughs> um, we, we got a cat recently, and if anyone wants an anxiety dampener, a cat is <laughs> amazing. Um, Pets are featuring quite prominently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anna Bob? 
I love my cooking. I love my baking. Uh, and as you said, mindfulness is not all about, you know, peaceful and yen. Uh, <laughs> it's about doing stuff that helps me. So, and photography has been a life changer for me in terms of going out into the landscape and just observing the sunset and capturing that. Um, and also coming out as gay as well. Um, came out in year nine and that was the most challenging part, but was the most, it was like weight lifted off my shoulder. Um, and that was a major, major um, forward, I think. So all of these hobbies um, are helping me and I feel anxiety is now becoming my friend rather than my enemy uh, because I used to fight it, but now we're good mates and now he's <laughs> sort of, uh, we're growing together and I feel like it's like a second human sitting next to me, you know. Mm. Thank you all so much for sharing uh, so much of your lives and your stories with us. It's been really great to talk to you all. And that is all we have time for here, but let's keep talking on Twitter and Facebook. And you can watch past episodes of Insight on SBS On Demand. Mm.